The one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of, are of the household of the faith. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for uh, the gathering of the saints this Lord's Day. Um, we thank you for your, your word that is truth. We pray, Lord, for the preaching of your word this morning, and we pray that you would prepare all hearts that are here this morning to receive the, your word, and that your word would not return to you void. We lift all these prayers to you this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Uh, you can go ahead and open your Bibles to that text David just read for us, Galatians chapter 6, kind of in the middle of the New Testament, be verses 6 through 10. But just before we dig in, I want to show you something. It's not uh, terribly snazzy, but here it is anyways. This is an overview of the church membership process. How do you become a member of Cross Point Baptist Church? In little written form, there should be, I see them, there's a bunch of them over there by the bulletins. And uh, the goal here is not to be innovative or snazzy, or schnazzy, however you say that. The goal <laughs> is, uh, is just to make it transparent and accessible and easy. So in case you didn't know, if you're not a member of Cross Point Baptist Church, or any church for that matter, the way that we here have seemed uh, to do this that seems most prudent to us is that we have a membership class right now. Our brother Kevin, sitting in the back there, leads that class. There are four parts. The goal of the class is to help you know what we believe is the one true gospel. That's the point of Galatians, the text that we've been preaching through. What is the gospel? And then some basic essentials, not only about what we believe, but also how we try and live that out as best as we understand it from the pages of the New Testament. So that's step one, membership class. Secondly, as a part of becoming a member of this church, it says conversation. That would be sitting down with one of the pastors of our church. Right now, I'm the only one. God willing, in the future, there will be more of us. Uh, but we want to get to know you and not only know who you are and where you've come from and what the journey is like that God has brought you on, but also as you come in the front door, learn how I can care for you, how we, what your needs are, what, how you can be encouraged, what you need, how we can be a good pastor or pastors to you. That's number two. And then third, it says covenant, right? It's an alliteration. I'm a sucker for alliterations. Sorry about that. But covenant just means join the church, right? That's step three on a Sunday morning. We've had some of those recently. These are here, if, if, you, if you're not a Christian, you can pick one of these up on the way out, and it would be a really good way to learn what is the Bible about? Who is Jesus? All of those things are covered in multiple places in this process. You don't have to do it this way. There are other ways you could do it, but this is a way. Also, if you've been visiting here for weeks, months, even years, but you've never actually made any kind of commitment to a church, to a group of people, to say, I'm with you, you're with me, let's live this Christian life together, you also could pick one of these up and maybe consider uh, going through that process. I think it would be edifying and encouraging to you. And then last, if you're a member of Cross Point Baptist Church already, you also need to know about these because when you bring your friend Tony, you can give him one of these and say, hey, look, here you go. Maybe it would be, not only, it's not about boosting our numbers as a church, God forbid, no, 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 but it's about helping people get easy, clear, unobstructed access to the gospel and his people. That's the goal. So here they are. We're going to leave them over there for a while just to try and make the membership process easy. All good? All right, I almost said any questions. That would have been a mistake. Uh, <laughs> okay, so your Bibles are in Galatians. And just before we dig into the text, I want to ask you if you've heard of someone I'm sure you have named Benito Mussolini. Yeah, the, the sound, you know who he is. He was a fascist dictator of Italy from 1925 to 1945. That's during the Second World War. He was born at the end of the 1800s. He was a son of a blacksmith. Earlier on in his life, he was an ardent socialist. 
And according to one source, young Mussolini, this is shocking, was expelled from his first boarding school at age 10 for stabbing a fellow student. At 14, he stabbed another student, but was only suspended. Don't send your kids to that school. Later in life, he was really involved, of course, with politics. He led efforts, multiple, to overthrow the government. He stockpiled arms in his newspaper facility. He owned a newspaper related to political propaganda, almost certainly. And in his eventual rise to, to power, what you had is these fascists, they called them squads, that would take over city by city by city until his influence and control was complete. He achieved supremacy and became a dictator, even starting to refer to himself in a way that fit with that. What was the first thing you would do if you were a dictator? His first act, according to one source, was to demand special emergency powers allowing him to rig elections in the fascists' favor in the future. Right? We know about that use of emergency powers. And a lot of terrible things happened after that. We, in our American political terms, the suppression of the freedom of the press, suppression of the freedom of assembly, expulsion and arrest of rival political opponents, all the normal dictator stuff, right? The formation of internment camps, the proliferation of propaganda. You might know also that Mussolini and Hitler got in cahoots with each other uh, leading up to the time of the Second World War. So it won't surprise you that Mussolini soon called for the expulsion of foreign Jews from Italy. That's just, it's not good, right? It's not good. That's his rise to power. What about his decline? What happened to him? Where'd he go? Well, as World War II progressed, the people of Italy, the general population, began to believe they were going to lose. They were right. And they saw the writing on the wall, I suppose. And Mussolini's popularity declined, as you can imagine. And according to a source here on July the 25th, 1943, Mussolini was voted out of power by his own grand council. They turned on him. He was arrested, and he was sent to the island of La Maddalena, I suppose you'd say it. I'll try and fast forward a little bit. He was rescued from the island by Hitler's Germans. He was put back into control in the northern half of Italy as sort of Hitler's puppet dictator doing Hitler's will. He, like Hitler, began to kill Jews by the thousands, exterminating them in northern Italy. And then, of course, as the war progresses, the Allied forces began to press into Italy. He was captured, and there's some debate over what happened to him, but probably he was executed by a firing squad. I said he was unpopular. He was there with his mistress, not his wife. Both of their bodies were hung upside down at the Piazzale Loreto in Milan and displayed for crowds to kick and spit on. Dead bodies. Now there's a lot of lessons you could learn from a life like that one. But the one for now is that you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. Jesus said something like that. He said, those who live by the sword die by the sword. And we have sayings like that too. We say, you get what you put in, or you are what you eat, or no pain, no gain. So what's the point of, we all, you know, there's multiple sayings all saying basically the same thing. What's the point? It shouldn't come as a surprise that a man like Mussolini, given to warmongering, genocide, adultery, violence, deceit, propaganda, and all that ended up meeting a grisly death. That shouldn't surprise you. In other words, if you go out to your field and you plow it up and you take a satchel of thorn seeds and thistle seeds and you sow them out all over your field, you should not be surprised when later up come, what, thorns and thistles, right? You do reap what you sow. That's the way that God governs the world. And this is the same principle, oddly enough, that the Apostle Paul applies to the Galatians. We still say you reap what you sow, and we say it because the Apostle Paul said it to the Galatians. And that applies to us today. We need to heed the lesson. You do reap what you sow. Let's ask God for help. Father, we're getting ready to hear you speak. We believe that. And on this subject of sowing and reaping. And we confess, though we wish it weren't so, we have sown to the flesh. We've made foolish choices and sown to the flesh. We confess it. It's sin. How could we do that 
knowing your promises, knowing your great love for us in Christ, knowing that you are all that we need, all of our sufficiency is found up or found bound up in Christ. The passage that Kevin read earlier from Colossians, how could we turn away and so to the flesh? But we do. So we're thankful for passages like Galatians 5. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Thank you, Father, that the victory is already won. We fight a battle already decided. Thank you for that. Thank you that in Christ we're delivered and freed from chains that we couldn't break on our own. That Christ took our sins away, destroyed or broke the power of death and sin, especially the flesh, broke it so that now there's freedom not to sin, but from sin. Thank you. Thank you for King Jesus. Thank you that you've gathered us into this church. Thank you for the small groups here. Thank you for this group that's meeting tonight at the Troxel home. Thank you for these souls, Lord. We pray, based on our text today, that you would use their meeting, their fellowship over your word, to transform their lives so that they would Take their seeds of thorns and thistles and throw them out and burn them and sow to the Spirit and so reap the rewards. Use, use a small group to do that. Father, we pray for other local churches here in the States, far away, Trinity Church Southside, their elders Corey and Hunter. Thank you for these souls, Lord, this small church, seven families, treasuring Christ together day by day and week by week. Would you bless them? Would you give them, as they requested, Godly families, would you give them unity together as a church? And far away, Lord, Lucknow, India, a place none of us have probably ever been. Our brother, Harshit Singh, thank you for this man. Thank you for his faithfulness, his love for your word, his desire to love not only your people in some vague sense, but also the church, the particular group of people where he exists. Bless that church, Lord, in this giant one billion population country. Cause the, the parable of the leaven to exist there. Just a little leaven can make it to all one billion. So we pray that you would use them in that way. Pray also for those in authority, the governments, the uh, judges here over Munford, this county, J. Weber McCraw and A. Blake Neal, Lord, these men serving as judges, Lord, we pray in their case your will would be done as it is in heaven. And we pray for ourselves, Lord. Will you speak to us? Would you please speak to us? Would you cause the Holy Spirit to do his work using the fuel of your word to light fire in our hearts where it should be, to love Christ, to treasure him, and so delight in living for him? Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to look at our text in three parts. Anybody guess the first one? Context. I hope you take that lesson in all seriousness into your own Bible reading. Have you noticed how many passages we've tried to understand what they mean and the context has been the deciding factor? That's a good lesson to learn. The first point will be context. The second will be sowing to the flesh. And the third will be sowing to the Spirit. So context, sowing to the flesh, and sowing to the Spirit. So the context. In our passage, Paul is getting close to the end of this letter. Next week, God willing, will be our last sermon in Galatians. He's wrapping things up. At the beginning of the letter, he talked about what is the gospel, how God gave it to him, and what it is. It's not this. It's not this law-based, doing-based obedience that gains you in your favor with Christ. It's not the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law has been fulfilled in Christ. It's Christ only received by faith, and that just means doing nothing but receiving, trusting, accepting a gift. That's the gospel. And you don't need to go back and resurrect the Mosaic law and try to keep it. Well, a few sermons ago, a few weeks ago, Paul began to transition into laying out the implications for living. If that gospel is the real gospel, how should you live if you believe it? That's where Paul continues in our text today. And today he gets awfully personal. I don't know if you caught it when you read the text before today. Maybe you read it yesterday or 
Thursday or when David read it for us, but he does get personal. Part of being a Christian, Paul says, is to open your wallet and to lay it before the God of the universe and say, every dollar is yours. None of it is mine. It is all yours. Make me a faithful steward with what belongs to you, no strings attached. That's what Paul's talking about today. I don't know if it makes you nervous to hear a sermon about money. It might. You might have good reason for that, actually, to hear a preacher talk about money being something that makes you nervous. Because maybe you've had slimy past experiences on the subject. That's probably true with the number of people that are in this room. Maybe you've heard so many sermons on Malachi 3.8, Will a Man Rob God? Maybe you've seen the televangelists or other hucksters and shysters filling up their pockets with money they have extorted from the people of God, manipulating them with emotional manipulation tactics to get something out of them rather than trying to get something into them. You've probably seen that too. And I don't know what you think about paying pastors But in today's passage, there is no way around the subject. That's what the passage is about, most fundamentally. The reality is that God himself, even though nobody else in the room does, God himself sees all of our bank statements. He drags his finger down the ledger and balances your books. He sees what investments you have made and have not made. But before we get there, we need to situate our passage in the larger flow of thought, particularly thinking about last week's sermon text. You might not be able to connect them intuitively. In last week's passage, Paul Paul spoke of the beauty of humility in the life of a local church. He described the Christian, the walking by the Spirit Christian, who is able to look outside of himself to see the needs of other people, to make sacrificial choices, to bear their burdens. Or we say that so much. It means take their burdens and put them on their own shoulders. And he warned them about the inverse, the opposite. This person who folds in on himself, who ends up destroying himself because of this prideful self-obsession like the narcissist who ends up alone in isolation, forlorn and depressed. That's what happens if you're always looking inward. And he told them, You might remember that one of the chief marks of the Holy Spirit among a people, remember that? Is it numbers? He said one of the chief marks of the Holy Spirit's presence in a community is this pervasive and sweet aroma of the others-oriented, giving grace of King Jesus, filling up the room like incense would fill this one up. That aroma produced as the people of God look outside of themselves and serve and love and give others. That's what it looks like when the Holy Spirit shows up with three people or 3,000 people. The quality is the same regardless of the quantity. If you're looking for the Holy Spirit's presence, that's what you look for. Now maybe you can see the connection between that kind of humble, others-oriented, bear-your-burdens, spirit-filled way of living and what you do with your pocketbook. Would a spirit-filled person be mainly thinking of his money as something to use for himself? Or would he reflexively, irresistibly, think of his money as something to be leveraged to bless and even bear the burdens of other people? I think you know the answer to the question. The connection is clear. That's the subject of today's passage. That's how last week's passage and this one relate. They are the same theme. And especially, not just sharing your money generally, but especially sharing your money with your church. That's how the passage concludes, especially with the household of faith in verse 10. And even more narrowly, this concept of supporting pastors to be able to be free to do the work of the ministry. That's our context. That's what Paul's talking about. Let's look at the first option, the first choice that you have, sowing to the flesh. This is our second point, sowing to the flesh. By way of overview, Paul envisions two fields 
in verses 7 through 9. This field, imagine, a hundred acres, sprawling, flat field, is the field of the flesh. The sinful patterns of living and desiring, consonant with the old man, with Adam, the corrupted and fallen nature, turning in on itself, loving what God hates. It's barren, there's nothing out there, there's tumbleweeds, the ground is dry and cracked, the rain falls and rolls right off it. Nothing can grow there, it's desolate, nothing except thorns. That's the field of the flesh. But the other field is the field of the spirit. This is the new nature created in Christ. Your loves have been revolutionized so that you don't love the same things you always love, but now you love new things. You have new affections created by the new resident within you, the Holy Spirit, your new union with Christ. You want to bear the fruits of the Holy Spirit and live for him in a way that you didn't previously. This is the field of the Spirit. And you have a choice. Which field are you going to go to? You're going to put your seeds in one. You're a farmer. You're going to plow this one and sow over there. Sow means plant. You're going to put them there or you're going to plow this one. And you're going to put your seeds and your labor and your whole life's work over here in this field. You've got to start by sowing seeds somewhere. So let's look at the field of the flesh. Look at verse 7 in your Bibles. Galatians chapter 6. This is the verse that you know. Verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. This verse is a very helpful corrective to what Paul has been saying. Or maybe I should say, he's not correcting himself. This is a very helpful corrective to wrong responses to what he has just been saying. What do I mean by that? Paul has been trying to tell them that the gospel, God's gospel, is entirely free. It's not that you are not able only to make contributions to your salvation. It's that you must not, you dare not. Making contributions is damnable. Do not contribute. You contribute nothing. Your obedience doesn't count. Imagine taking your obedience and holding it up, and then holding up the crucified Christ, the Son of God, and looking at them side by side. Here is Christ crucified for all your salvation to give you his own righteousness with divine and eternal love just for you because he loves you. And then on this side is all your obedience. What a poor, pitiful thing it becomes. Reject it. Turn away from it. It doesn't count. The gospel is free. Now here's the deal. People will always respond to a free gospel in a way that proves that they didn't believe it in the first place. Not all people. There will always be people who respond in a way that proves they didn't believe it in the first place. They'll say something like this. Do you say this? Well, if it's free, then I can live how I want. If I can't get in any trouble from not serving, can't get any trouble from not evangelizing, I can't get in trouble from being unfaithful to my wife or fudging the numbers in my finances, there will be grace for that, then I'll just do those things and ask for forgiveness afterward. What Paul says in our passage obliterates that way of thinking like a grenade detonating inside of a glass vase. Notice that Paul does not, this is important, he does not, does not change his message because people responded to it wrongly. That's the whole point of Galatians. Don't change the message. There's only one. You change it, it's not the message anymore. The fact that some people will abuse the message, that's the gospel of free grace, doesn't justify changing it. Paul said, if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be a curse. There is no changing the gospel, no matter how people respond. You could go someplace and your heart could break into a thousand tiny pieces because every single person that you told the true gospel to rejects it and responds in perversions, wrong ways of responding to the gospel. Every one of them, don't you dare change it if they do that. Keep the one true gospel. Jesus saves all by himself or not at all. Christ or nothing. So what's the correction? What correction does Paul give? The answer is, you reap what you sow. You say you've believed in Christ, and now you will reap what you sow. 
So imagine you walk out into this 100-acre field, the field of the flesh. You hook up your old, olden times, right? Your old plow to your oxen. You hop on the plow and you ride down the rows. You're making rows. You ride down there. You're pulling up the clods of earth, breaking it up into pieces, getting ready for planting. And then deciding that you're going to put thorn seeds and thistle seeds. You did it on purpose. You knew what you were doing. The bag was labeled correctly. And then imagine being surprised when four months later you're bleeding down your ankles because you walked through thorns and thistles. How could you be surprised? You will reap what you sow. That's what Paul's saying to the Galatians. If you choose to respond to the free gospel by sowing to the flesh, you will reap the fruits of sowing to the flesh. You get what you sow. You harvest what you planted. Now people do this. It sounds insane, doesn't it? Who plants thorns and thistles and then is surprised by it? Everybody. So many people do it all the time, right? I mean it in our lives. We don't do it with thorns and thistles, but we do it in life. And why? I'll tell you one big reason that people do it. This, I'm sure, is not the only reason, but it's a big reason that people do it. And it's that there's a delay. There's a delay between putting seeds in the ground and then finally harvesting your crop. It's like that with God. We think that a delayed judgment on God's part is a canceled judgment. And it is not. Consider how much time when planting has to elapse in the cycle. You start working, depending on what you're planting, nine months maybe before you expect to heap up the crop in your barn. You start in the springtime, sun comes out, Winter's over, you plow the field, you sow the seeds, they grow all summer. Finally, in the fall, out go the tractors for the harvest. There's this long gap, I don't know, February to September. It's a long time. There's a delay. And God doesn't bring his judgment immediately either. He'll let you go on sowing to the flesh if that's what you choose to do. Many people go on doing that. They live a life of self-gratification, indulging whatever desire happens to flood your heart at any given moment. You are God. You are autonomous. All your desires must be right. Be true to yourself and so gratify whatever comes to you at the moment, whether it's drugs or sex or wealth or fashion, things that glitter, relationships, prestige, houses, violence, anger, gossip, or just apathetic sloth and ease, that American dream that lulls so many people to sleep and they idolize the gifts, the good things that God gives, and so forsake the giver, thinking all the time that they're blessed when they're under God's curse. The judgment is delayed, though. And maybe they don't find out until it's too late. They don't experience very much by way of immediate negative consequences. At least not yet. And... We, I should say we, not they, we mistakenly believe that our perceived getting away with it for now will last forever. But Paul says the harvest is coming. Don't you think Mussolini must have thought something like that during his rise to power? Man, things were looking good for him if what you're after is control. They were looking great until it all came crashing down. Listen, if you're not a Christian... And you're here. I'm so glad that you're here. You're welcome here. To be a Christian is to not have it all figured out. To not be all cleaned up. To be all kinds of messed up. To have lived your whole life sowing to the flesh with a really long list of bad decisions that hurt people and dishonor God. And then to lay all that before Jesus at the foot of the cross and be forgiven even though you don't deserve it. So if you're here and you're not a Christian, it's okay that you're all kinds of messed up. We're so glad that you're here. And I think this passage is a warning to you that if you go on sowing to the flesh, the harvest is coming. There's no way around it because God himself will bring it to pass. It's not deism and God's the cosmic clockmaker and he sets the world up and then things kind of click into place like he envisioned thousands of years ago. It's not like that. It's that There is a God who exists. He watches everything you do, every thought you make. 
Remember I said he runs his finger down the ledger of your life. He sees everything. Why will the harvest come? The great harvester is coming to reap his harvest. He personally will ensure that the harvest comes to every single person. God is never mocked. Nobody gets away with it. Nobody slips through the cracks. Receive it as a warning that would cause you to come to your senses and instead of finding condemnation, be loved in Christ more than you could ever imagine. Trust him. Receive his love. Now, I mentioned some examples of sowing to the flesh before, but Paul highlights, as I said, one specific primary example. And that example is itemized on the transaction history of your bank account. Look at verse 6 of chapter 6. The one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. This is one example of what it looks like to be filled with the Spirit, to be humble, to be others-oriented, to be a kingdom-minded Christian. The example is, pay your pastors. Now, I know it's awkward. I know that. You think I didn't notice, notice that, getting ready to preach this sermon? You need the truth of God nonetheless, not about me. That's the application. At least the pastors who work hard at teaching and preaching, I hope to persuade you today that even though the world would just stomp on and reject that idea, and even some newfangled, trendy-ish kind of ideas in Christianity saying that it's not the most efficient way to do church, that they're all wrong. That the clear testimony of God in the scriptures is that it's God's good idea to free those pastors who work hard at preaching and teaching to do it, to have time to do it. It's God's idea. I hope to persuade you of that this morning. Look at the verse, verse 6. There are two people. There's the one who has taught the word, and there's the one who teaches him. That's what's happening right now. So long as there's been a God who speaks in words, he has ordained that he would put men in place to teach the people those words. God is a God of speaking. He speaks. In the Old Testament, you had teachers and scribes and prophets. They were servants of the word. In fact, you might, know, you might not know this. Most biblical prophecy is not all of it, but much of it, I should say, is looking backwards to what God had already said and calling people back to the faithfulness that God had instructed them to. Some of it is looking forward. Much of it is looking back. And in the New Testament, it's the same. There were apostles, and there are still pastors and teachers. So Jesus said in Matthew 10.10, 10, the worker is worthy of his support. The Apostle Paul said elsewhere, 1 Corinthians 9, 14, those who proclaim the gospel should get their living from the gospel. He also said, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. We don't do that kind of farming. It means the ox is out there threshing, harvesting the grain. He gets to eat some while he harvests the grain. Don't put a muzzle on him so that he can't eat any of your harvest. Let him eat as he works. Paul also said in 1 Timothy 5.17, the elders who work hard at teaching and preaching should be considered worthy of double honor. I think basically all commentators agree double honor is a way of referring to financial support. Paul calls it in our passage, all good things. Share all good things. In other words, the idea of financially supporting pastors is clear, it's repeated, it's widespread in the teaching of the New Testament. It's also reaffirmed by the history of the church for the last 2,000 years that the normal pattern is that if a church is able to do it, it is God's good blessing to them to free the pastor from having to get a job outside so he can spend his time in the word and prayer. That's God's idea. Amazingly. You think, I don't know it's amazing. A guy like me, God wants to... It's his way. That's what he does. Why does he do that? What's the point? 
Are they supposed to get a free ride and an easy life or something like that? No. No. Why should you support your pastors? And I mean, if you're here, I mean, if later we have two pastors, I mean, if you move to Missouri and join a different church. The principle is the same. Why? Why should a church do whatever it can to support its pastor or pastors? Why can't they get a job? Why can't they get their living from working like I used to work at a hospital? Wouldn't that relieve the burden? Wouldn't that be a faithful example of bearing one another's burdens? Couldn't I bear your burden? It would go against all of the verses that I just quoted to you from the rest of the New Testament and the clear command of God, that way of thinking. The reason is that pastors are not divine. They have to work at understanding the Bible. It doesn't just come naturally like a lightning bolt. You have to work hard at it. Pastors don't start out. This is kind of should be obvious with knowing all the answers, either about life or about any particular passage. When I first read this passage in preparation for today, I could not understand how verse 6 related to what came before or what came after. I didn't understand it. I think that happens <laughs> the majority of weeks. Pastors are men of clay feet like you are, and they'll have to, like that passage I mentioned to you from 1 Timothy 5, work hard at teaching and preaching. I do not think a church should financially support a pastor who will not work hard at preaching and teaching. But those pastors who do work hard at preaching and teaching, this is what God's command applies to. Faithful teaching requires study. And study requires time. Therefore, you can't give all your time away in some other kind of vocation, if at all possible. It's not only study. Maybe you know the passage in Acts chapter 6, where I believe very much the first deacons came from. You have this controversy. I'll make it the really short version. This controversy, you have the apostles. This is in Jerusalem. And there's two groups of widows, Jewish and Greek, we'll call them widows. And there's a dispute that one's being given special privilege over the other. The apostles the prototypical pastors, so to speak, say, let's appoint some godly guys full of the Holy Spirit to go and serve in this really important thing over here because we can't, because it wouldn't be right for us to neglect the duty that God gave us. What's the duty? The ministry of prayer and the word. So it's not only the word, it's not only study, it's also the ministry of prayer. That's what God has called pastors to do. And I don't mean exclusively in a literalistic sense, but the fundamental basic duty of pastors is to study and feed and protect the flock through the word and to be on his knees praying for them. You get a guy like that, you would be well served. You would be benefited to make sure he can do it with as much time as he can. Pastors are not divine. They are weak Men of clay feet, sinful men with broken pasts, broken presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-T, issues, problems, severely limited by finitude and weakness and sin, fighting the same fights that you are, regular Joes, 87 octane, not different. So to share all things with your pastor is to acknowledge his weakness his need of time and resources if he's going to supply you with healthy, rich, nourishing food as a congregation. If every day you went home for breakfast, lunch, and dinner and you ate TV dinners, that would show up in your body, in your health. You would pay the price. I hope no one in here does that. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to offend you if you do. But I said before, one of the phrases we use, you are what you eat. It's true, right? It's true. And it's a tremendous blessing for a congregation to have a pastor who can spend time preparing the meal and feeding you rich, healthy food that will show up also in your health. I'm basically saying you reap what you sow. When a church pays a pastor, you are not sacrificing, in, that, in the most literal sense, anything. You are not making a donation for which you never see a reward. 
You're making an investment in your own spiritual eternity, not to mention the benefit of your fellow church member, members pardon me, and the surrounding community and the ends of the earth with all the nations who reside there. There's a reward. There's a harvest. That's how investments work. You don't invest in things where you don't expect to get anything back. That's not an investment. Providing for pastors to work hard at preaching and teaching and prayer is an investment. It's like sowing good seed and you should expect a return, a harvest. Verse 6, let the one who has taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches him. That verse is a topic sentence. Remember I said I didn't know how it fit? That's how it fits. It's a topic sentence for the five following verses, the rest of our sermon text. He explains in warning fashion, I believe, what a bad mistake it would be to not sow good seed in the field and the malnourishment you would experience if you chose not to do that. In our next point, we'll touch more on what is the harvest. That does beg the question, doesn't it? What should you expect? But we're concluding our first point, really our second point, sowing to the flesh. And the warning, I think that's what Paul is saying. We use the, we use the phrase as a warning, you reap what you sow now, be careful. That's what Paul's saying. If you want a church to lose its fidelity to the gospel, which is the whole point of the book of Galatians, do not lose your fidelity to the gospel. If you want a church to lose its fidelity to the gospel, don't pay your pastors. That's a good way to try to get there. If you want to see your church preaching some other gospel, one good way to do it is to make sure that your pastors are strapped for money struggling to pay their bills, unable to devote adequate time to studying God's word. Make sure they feel forced to pit care for the church against care for their family. If you sow the seeds of poison ivy in the dirt, you will soon have itchy, blistered, oozing sores. Right? There's no way around it. You will reap what you sow. I said you have two choices, though. You could sow to the flesh or you could sow to the spirit. Choice number two is sowing to the spirit. It's the inverse principle of sowing to the flesh. This is the Christian embracing the gospel of free grace, contributing zero obedience, saved by Jesus only, loved no matter what I have done or will do, free salvation, she knows that she doesn't merit anything by her obedience, including her financial contributions. God forbid we think we earn something meritorious from God based on our financial contributions. She knows she doesn't. She knows it's free. She knows there's no strings attached. She rejoices in God's love for her in Christ. And so she embraces. She delights to embrace generosity because she delights in her generous God. This Christian believes the true gospel. She knows that she was made in God's image and defied his lordship. She separated herself from God. She was made for his approval, but she earned his condemnation. And yet she sees in the testimony of God's word that the son of God entered into this world. It's raining outside, I hear it. He was rained on. This world, not an imaginary one, this one, God in the flesh, perfect in his obedience, crucified so undeservingly, a substitute execution, the slaughtering of an innocent lamb, pure, spotless, small, helpless, slaughtered. He embraced it. Talk about bearing burdens and generous giving. He loves you. She knows it. This Christian does, full of the Holy Spirit. She sees the risen Christ, the king of love, ruling not with a hard fist, but with the cords of love bound to the hearts of all his people. She feels, she knows, she believes on the testimony of God's word, his great worth and majesty as the risen king of the world. Her whole life is turned upside down, and it is her delight to live for him. Not because she has to. Not because she's scared of what will happen to her if she doesn't. Jesus said, if you, what? You will keep my commandments. 
If you do what? You'll keep my commandments. What makes you keep his commandments? If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's why she keeps his commandments. She loves him. And her joy, her preference, her pleasure is to embrace the things that delight his own heart. She's forever abandoned the field of the flesh where she sowed and reaped year after year after year with all kinds of awful things, filling up her basket with thorns. And now she's a happy laborer in God's field, sowing to the Spirit and reaping all the blessings of God in the process. It's her joy to walk by the Spirit. That's what Christian living is. As a preview, two weeks from now, God willing, we'll start, I almost said the Gospel of Ruth, the Book of Ruth. We'll start the Book of Ruth. There's this moment where Ruth, a Moabite, stands before Boaz and he notices her. And she thinks, oh, maybe I can just glean in his fields. I'll just be a servant. I'll kind of get by like that. And then he surprises her with this unbelievable, undeserved, unexpected generosity. And he says, no, no, no. You come. He sits her down at his table. He feeds her this great meal. That's what it is to be a Christian, to say, oh, I, I, I can't believe you would be kind to me at all. And then to have an avalanche of God's kindness and love poured on you in Christ. And then to live correspondingly, oh, I love you. I want to obey you. That's Christian obedience. Not a slavish fear that if you get it all wrong, you'll get kicked out. That's not real obedience. But I said the primary contextual application is about supporting pastors. Now, do you know, you do know, I hope you know, that nowhere in the New Testament is the Old Testament tithe said to be binding on Christians in the New Covenant. I don't know if you know that. It's okay if you say the word tithe. It's not a taboo. It's fine. But I want you to know that what God required of his people in the Old Testament, a literal 10% tithe, is nowhere in the New Testament said to be binding on Christians, on you. God doesn't require you in the law of Moses still alive for you today to contribute 10% of the first fruits of your harvest to him. I don't know if you know that. The tithe is no more required of Christians in circumcision and dietary laws. It's in that bucket, part of the Mosaic Covenant. So did nobody give in the New Covenant, in the pages of the New Testament? No, they did give, didn't they? What was the principle that determined how much and when and why they would give? The principle is the inexplicably generous heart of God in giving an indescribable gift in the life, death, and resurrection of his son. The principle is you receive an indescribable gift and your heart is transformed and you love generosity. That's the principle. That's why God loves a cheerful giver. The principle is give as much as you can. The principle of the widow's might. You might remember she put in just a little bit after all these people put in all this money, but she had nothing. What's the principle? John Piper put it really well. It's not about how much you give. It's about how much you keep. You see that? The widow kept nothing. She gave very little. She kept nothing. And Jesus was pleased with her worshipful and exceedingly generous giving. That's the principle. Leverage all of your life for the glory of Christ and the good of his people and the spread of the gospel. Everything you have, if you can afford to give it, with, and you would give it with generous joy, give it. That's the principle. Give like the heart of God delighted to give Christ to you. And Paul does generalize the application, the sowing and reaping. It's not only about It's not only about paying pastors. It's also not only about financial giving in general. It's not only about money. He generalizes. Look at verse 9. He tells them not to lose heart in doing good. And you might say, well, maybe that's about money still, kind of indirectly. But then look at verse 10. This is grand finale, his great conclusion of the paragraph, and maybe even the sections that preceded. 
where he says, so then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. Oh, man, now that's very generalized, right? Can you get much more general, more generally applicable than do good to all people? He says, especially the household of faith, but doing good to all people is very general. Sowing and reaping applies in the context, especially to paying pastors, more broadly to what you do with your money in general, and then more broadly than that, just love your neighbor. Do good to all people. There's this, I mentioned before, this delay. Just so you can see where I got that, delay. It's not only just the illustration of sowing and reaping and it takes time. Look at your Bible. I see four ways in the passage that there's a delay. Look at verse 8. What will you expect to reap? The answer in verse 8 is eternal life. Eternal life. Now that's, of course, in stark contrast from keeping your money and spending it on all the moth food, right? Eternal life. There's a reward later. Look at verse 9. I see three more ways in which Paul refers to a delay. He tells them not to lose heart. Don't lose heart. Well, that kind of implies, doesn't it, that you're going to have to keep going for a while. It might be a grind. And then secondly, he says that they'll reap in due time later. Right? You might not get all your rewards now. You might have to wait. He tells them, third, this is our fourth one in total, not to give up. Don't give up. Again, it implies you have to keep going for a while. There's no, there's not a guarantee anyways of immediate gratification. You might have to wait. You might not see the fruits of your labor. You will have to exercise faith. Looking forward to what you can't yet see, but trusting that it will be there. That's what faith is, or that it is there. But eventually, it will be harvest time. You will reap what you sow. I, I talked about the principle before in thinking about sowing to the flesh as a warning. I think that's right. But it works both ways. It's not only a warning. It's also a promise. There's a delay but you have a promised harvest at the end. There are promises made to people who turn to this field and sow to the Spirit. There are rewards. The hardworking, farmers, the hardworking farmer always expects a harvest. Can you imagine if you didn't think there was going to be a harvest, would you go to all the trouble? Plowing, sowing, irrigating. No, of course not. You only do that if you think there is a reward. There's blessings with obedience. God will bless obedience. There are rewards for sowing to the Spirit. Now, if the application, the most specific and pointed contextual application, is the support of those pastors who work hard, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching, paying pastors, if that's the sowing, what are the rewards? <laughs> what are you going to get out of it? What should you expect? How will God bless you? It's not that you demand from him rewards, but you should expect rewards. That's the point of the passage. You will reap what you sow. You should expect to be a more Christ-like person 20 years from now than you are today. Are you struggling with sins that you can't seem to shake free from? If you will give your life to a local church, and in this passage, I have to say it, contribute to the needs of the church financially and put yourself under faithful, healthy, Christ-centered, faithful to the word preaching, those things that nag you and eat away at you now and drive you crazy and make you depressed, you should expect that you will be a more Christ-like person 20 years from now. I do not mean temptation will never go away. I do mean to say God will transform your character. You should expect to be a different person. You should expect that when the storms of life come blowing into your life, that your house, your house excuse me, can withstand the gales and not fall and crash. Years of listening to God's words preached shores up and buttresses all your house so that when life gets really hard and some tragedy hits, your house stands up. And you don't walk away from the faith and you're able to be sustained. You should expect that God's promises will be sweeter and more anchoring to the ship of your life 
when the hurricanes come and threaten to capsize it. His promises should get weightier and more precious to you as time goes on. You should expect your desires would change so that this field of the flesh over here and all the harvest it produces would taste more like trash. You would hate it more. And the life in the Spirit, walking by the Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit, sowing and reaping from the Spirit would taste more like the sweetness of a peach. You would love, you would hate rather, what you should hate more and love what you should love more. You should expect that. You should expect that you'll persevere in the faith because of hearing faithful teaching and that you would persevere in a way that you would not have if you'd been a lone ranger or Christian out there somewhere disconnected from God's people and not sitting under healthy teaching and preaching of the Bible. I had a seminary professor who told me that when he goes to church on Sundays... Instead of listening to the pastor preach the sermons, this guy is a prolific scholar of the New Testament. Instead of listening to the pastor, he reads the passage himself because he expects to glean more from his own personal reading of the passage than he would get from his, the pastor of his local church. That is atrocious. The reason it's atrocious is because it goes directly against what God has declared is the way that God will bless this man. Right? You don't get to reinvent it and say, I don't need your way. I'm good enough to do it my own way. No, it's so ordinary. One guy up here explaining, teaching, proclaiming, and bringing to bear the truth of God's word on people. Yes, that's what God has chosen to do. You should expect to reap a harvest that is extraordinary from the ordinary means of listening to faithful preaching. It's astounding. It is astounding to me that we would receive spiritual profit of eternal consequence, heaven and hell in the balance, from an ordinary person preaching God's word. And that's God's way. That's what he said he'll do. So I have to say, I can't not, I have to say thank you you, cross point, for doing what this passage commands in my own case. You're a generous people. The fact that I'm standing here at this moment is evidence that you are a generous and giving people, that you are sowing to the Spirit, obeying the passage, sharing all good things with the one who teaches the word. If you didn't know and you're in this room, I don't have another job. This is it. That means that you guys, by your generous, gospel-saturated, God is so good to me I can't help but give, that kind of giving, are the reason I'm standing here. I want you to know, I mean this, that being here with you, working hard at preaching and teaching, telling you God's word, trying to help it come to bear wanting the Spirit to make it come to bear on your lives, to figure out how to live the Christian life together and how to worship God, is one of the deepest joys of my life. Thank you so much. Amen. And listen, one of the reasons that I can say a sentence like that is because I understand in the marvelous mysterious mind of God that your enabling me to stand here is to your benefit. It's not Matt gets to do such and such. It's that God will bless the church through means like this. So I praise God for you. And I also invite you to pray for more pastors. You're aware, I'm sure, that our church voted, I think it was August of 2023, to restructure our bylaws to require and even produce a plurality of pastors. That's not forgotten. We're in the process of revising. Uh, that's not the right way to say it. Taking what the church voted on and putting it into the existing bylaws so that our bylaws match what we voted on. Right? That's the process. It's not forgotten. It's in process. Soon you'll be hearing more about it. I'm inviting you to pray 
that God himself, the Lord Jesus, like it says in Ephesians 4, will provide more pastors so that we all will benefit from God's way of using them to bless his people. Pray about that. Pray about that. We should conclude. The main point of the passage is that you are free in Christ. Loved, even though you deserve none of it. Free totally. Righteous in him. Free. And so now you should live by walking in step with the Spirit. You should humbly leverage your life for other people, especially the household of faith, and specifically by supporting those pastors who work hard at teaching and preaching. That's the point of the passage. If you hear that, and you say, I don't have to obey, and you respond by saying, well, I can indulge the flesh, you are almost certainly not a Christian. I don't mean this as a joke. It sounds funny. In the same way as an ox doesn't fly, a Christian does not do that. That's not what Christians do. They're not equipped to respond like that. If that's your response, things will catch up with you. You will reap what you're sowing, just like they did with Mussolini. But the main point of the passage that I want to leave with you is to embrace with joy the heart of God expressed in a generous, burden-bearing, others-oriented, giving-not-taking mindset that Christ Jesus himself demonstrated on the cross. Imagine him saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And then to walk in step with the Spirit. Cross point, don't give up. Don't lose heart. Don't get so tired that you give out. For some of you, it's been a long year. It's been a long year. We had an unusual year in the history of our church. For some of you, it's been a long several decades. Life maybe feels hard and long. And the message of this passage is that one day, if you don't give up, it will all be worth it. All of it. One day, you'll be sitting on mountains of a heaped up harvest, rejoicing that God used even our little widow's might to yield an eternal harvest. That's your future. That's where you're headed. Don't give up. That's where you're going. Life can be so hard. It can feel so long. And in the middle of all that, God holds out a promise of a harvest. He will not let you down. You will not be disappointed. A sacrificial, give up what you could have had for the good of other people and the glory of Christ. Live below your means. Forgo some of the pleasures of earthly life because of a sacrificial giving that's full of the joy and generous giving of Christ. Change your lifestyle. That kind of thing, you'll never regret it because you will reap the reward. When you get to the end, you will look back and you say, I can't believe I gave something so small to, give something so, to get something so big and so grand. That kind of sacrificial life for Christ is a well-spent, blessed life. So let's give ourselves to that and trust God to supply the harvest when it's all said and done.